Good morning. I, I got in trouble <laughs> backstage, and I, I'm now a prisoner. These are real handcuffs, by the way. Um, I cannot get out of these. Does anybody have a key? Claire, do you have a key? You, you don't. Any Robinsons? Do you get? You, do you get? Anybody have a key? I, I really can't get out of this. This is going to be really hard to preach a sermon with handcuffs. Anybody? Does any? Seriously, I, I need to get out of these. I can't. Anybody have a key? You got a key? No, that's not going to work. That's a car key. What do you, do you even know what handcuffs are? Okay. Any, anyone have a key? I really, seriously, I need to, I need some help here. I got one. Oh, Taylor. Oh, give Taylor a hand, Taylor Noah a hand here. All right. Oh, thank you so much. Do you know how to use these? Sometimes. Oh, here we go. Okay. All right. All right. I'm free. Yay. I'm free. Oh. Hi. I am so relieved. I am so relieved. Kids, I really didn't get in trouble. This was just for fun. Just to illustrate something we're going to talk about today, and it is, what do you think? Freedom, freedom. So uh, we have freedom in Christ. We're going to talk about that today in our series on the book of Galatians. Now, so we're going to talk about spiritual freedom, spiritual freedom. So how do we get it? What keeps us from living in it? And what do we do with it? Those are the questions I'm going to try to answer today from the text. We're, we're getting closer to the end of our series in the book of Galatians. This is our fall series in the book of Galatians. The, the series is called Only One Gospel. There's only one gospel, only one good news. Uh, so we're getting close to the end. We only got three weeks left of this series. And then we get into a Christmas series, which is called, I'm not going to tell you yet. You're just going to have to come back next week and we'll, we'll tell you. But Galatians is really broken up simply, uh, and this is how it's structured. Chapters 1 and 2 is an autobiography of Paul. Chapters 3 and 4 is the theology of justification by faith alone in Christ. And chapters 5 and 6 is application to daily life. We have worked our way through the first two sections of Galatians, and now here we're in the third section, chapters 5 and 6. So if you have a Bible with you, I hope you do. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. We finished chapter 4 last week. We are now getting into the application to daily life. How do we live as those who are set free? We're going to see today in Galatians 5 verses 1 through 15. Galatians 5 verses 1 through 15. If you grabbed a hardback CSB off the cart as you came in, uh, you can turn to page 1034. I want us to all look at the text together today, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. And when we think about spiritual freedom, we need to answer these questions. How do I get it? What keeps me from living in it? And what do we do with it? So first, how do we get it? How do we get spiritual freedom? We get it in Christ. So freedom in Christ. Christ. That's the key. How do we get spiritual freedom? We get it in Christ. Now, there's three parts to this section. If you're taking notes, the first part is holding on to freedom. Holding on to freedom. So if you have a Bible, look at verse 1. What does it say? It says, for freedom, Christ set us free. Now, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Just pause there. We'll stop. We'll finish the rest of verse 1 in a minute. This is phrased in an interesting way. The NIV translates it, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. This is a way of saying the purpose for which Christ set us free is freedom. One commentator says, for the sake of or with the goal of freedom, Christ set us free. In other words, Christ did not set us free so we could be bound to the law. That's been the theme as Paul's been talking about this through Galatians. No, he didn't set us free so we could be bound to following every part of the law. No, he wants us to live in freedom. John Stott helps us to understand what kind of freedom we're talking about. Here's what John Stott says. Freedom of conscience, freedom from the tyranny of the law, the dreadful struggle to keep the law with a view of winning the favor of God. In other words, we are free. We are set free from justifying ourselves. 
from saving ourselves by works of the law. Philip Ryken defines this freedom as liberation from sin, death, and the devil. That's a good freedom, isn't it? Christ has set us free for freedom. Now what? Look at the next part of verse 1. Next part of verse 1. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Because Christ set us free for freedom, the Galatians and we are charged to stand firm. So how do we do it? How do we do that? How do we stand firm? Well, we see it in the next phrase. Don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, this word submit carries the idea of to be loaded down like an ox carrying a heavy yoke. That's the picture that Paul has in mind here. Now, last week, if you were here, we talked about Ishmael and who? Help me out here. Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was born into slavery. Isaac was born into what? Freedom. Paul has just told the Galatians, you are not Ishmael's, you are Isaac's. So don't live as if you are Ishmael. Don't submit again to slavery if you are free. Don't go back. Don't go back to slavery. Stand firm. Live, live as one who is free from the power of sin, the sting of death, and the devil. So hold on to freedom in Christ because we know uh, the law won't give us freedom. Uh, that's next. Uh, the law fails to set us free. The law fails to set us free. We see that in verses uh, 2 and 3. Verses 2 and 3 and into verse 4. So let's look at verse 2 and 3. Paul says, take note. I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourselves circumcised, Paul or Christ will not benefit you at all. Again, I testify uh, to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to do the entire law. Now, again, you have to have been tracking with us in Galatians to understand what he's talking about here. Getting circumcised will, Paul says, put them on track to being obligated to do the entire law. Why? Why is that? By getting circumcised, they would be sending a signal. What signal? Frank Thielman tells us being circumcised would imply, here's what he says, a lack of confidence in the effectiveness of Christ's death to redeem the believer from the law's curse and a vote of confidence in one's own ability to keep the law and receive life by that means. Now, we'll just simplify this. In other words, Christ's death on the cross was not enough. That's the signal that they would be sending if they are circumcised. Christ's death on the cross was not enough. I will do my part to earn salvation. I'll do my part to earn salvation. But this is not true, and it does not work. We see that in verse 4. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. John Stott says, oh, actually, let me back up. So let's talk about this phrase, justified by the law. Okay, again, we keep coming back to this term, justified. It's a legal term, declared righteous. And he said, you're trying to be declared righteous. You're trying to be declared innocent by the law. He says, you who are doing that, you who are trying to be justified by the law are is to say, alienated from Christ, and you've fallen from grace. Why is that? Because the person who is trying to justify themselves by the law and not grace has fallen from grace. You, you, your salvation has become about works, not about grace. It's about you, not about God and what he's done for you. John Stott says this, to add circumcision is to lose Christ. To seek to be justified by the law is to fall from grace. You cannot have it both ways. It is impossible to receive Christ, thereby acknowledging that you cannot save yourself and then receive circumcision, thereby claiming you can. Can't have it both ways. So in other words, what Paul is saying, Jesus plus circumcision equals nothing. Jesus, we could say, plus being a good person is nothing. Jesus plus going to church, being baptized, membership, church membership is nothing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. 
That's what we need. We need Jesus and Jesus alone to be saved. It's not our works. It's not the works of the law. It's not what we do. It's about what Jesus already did. And Paul uses vivid language here for those who are trying to be justified by the law. The CSB doesn't use the same word. The CSB says they are alienated. You see that in the text? They are alienated from Christ. But the ESV renders it severed. Severed. Now let's remember, what are we talking about? This is surely a play on words regarding circumcision. They're severed, cut off. Philip Ryken makes this connection. He says, circumcision involves cutting off the male foreskin. If they got circumcised now that they belong to the new covenant, they would be cutting themselves off from Christ. Now kids, if you don't know what circumcision is, Go home and ask your mom and dad. (laughs) They'd love to tell you over lunch. (laughs) So, why? Why? They're trying to justify themselves by the flesh, quite literally. Trying to justify themselves quite literally by the flesh. The law fails to set us Free, that's the point. Now, how are we set free then? How are we set free? We are set free by what? What do you think? Faith. We've been talking about this through the whole series. We're set free by faith. Look at verse five. For we eagerly await through the Spirit by what? What does it say? Faith, the hope of righteousness. How do we receive the hope of righteousness? How do we receive it? Through the Spirit by what? Faith. Faith. Not through the flesh, by effort. That's the contrast. Not through the flesh, by effort. The Spirit's work, the Holy Spirit's work is vital. Jesus said he convicts the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we need the Holy Spirit at the moment of our conversion, the moment we trust Christ for our salvation and our whole lives as Christians, which we're going to see more next week as we see the fruit of the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit. Our only hope is not our ability to follow God's law perfectly, but it's based on faith in Christ alone. Look at verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is what? Faith. Faith working through love. In the book of Romans, it's interesting, in the book of Romans, Paul addresses Gentile believers that are proud. They are not circumcised. Here's what he says. He says, don't boast that you are better than the Jews. Circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't really matter. John Stott tells us the point Paul is making to the Galatians. He says, All that is necessary in order to be accepted with God is to be in Christ. And we are in Christ by faith. So this term, we've talked about this already in this series, in Christ Jesus, in Christ. That is union with Christ. We are in him. He is in us. If we are in union with Christ, it does not matter It does not matter if you've been circumcised or not. That's the point Paul is making. If you are in union with Christ, you don't, it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not. It doesn't matter whether you follow the Mosaic law to a T. Paul is basically saying you can be circumcised, you can not be circumcised. That is not what matters in the end. What matters? What matters? We see it at the end of verse 6. Faith working through love. So let me ask you this morning, very simply, are you free. You know, I was bound at the beginning of the message, right? Like I was not free. I, my hands were in handcuffs. Are you free spiritually? Are you free? How can I get free? Maybe you aren't free today. Maybe you haven't been forgiven. Maybe you feel like you're a mess inside. You're all tied up. You don't know where you stand with God. You're trying your best to be a good person But you have no assurance that if you died today, you'd be accepted by God. I'm talking to you right now, okay? Jesus loves you more than you can imagine. He died for you on the cross in your place. 
You cannot, I want to tell you, you cannot be made right with God by trying to be a good person. That's not how we're saved. You can only be made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. It's a decision of the heart. I hope you'll make this decision right now, right now. Whether you're watching online, whether you're here in person, repent, turn away from your sin and your own efforts to be good enough and believe alone on Jesus. He's the only one who can save us and he's done everything necessary to bring us salvation, to make us justified, declared innocent, declared righteous, seen by God as righteous. That's given to us as a gift the moment we receive Jesus. So do you have freedom? We have freedom in Christ. That leads to the second question we asked. What keeps us from it? What keeps us from freedom? Number two, obstacles to freedom. Obstacles to freedom. There's a couple. There's a couple. First, persuasion. Persuasion. Look at verse seven and eight. You were running well. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding the truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Paul loves, by the way, if, you, if you've read a lot of Paul's epistles, he loves using athletic metaphors. He loves to use athletic metaphors. Remember at the end of his life, he said, I've run the good race, right? I've kept the faith. He, he loves talking about athletic metaphors. So here we see another one. What do you say at the beginning of verse 7? He said, you were what? Running well. I was actually contemplating wearing like a jogging suit with handcuffs. <laughs> but I decided not to. This is a picture of a race, the, the race of life. And the Galatians, he said, you were on track. You were on track when I left. You're running the race of faith in Christ alone, not seeking to be saved by works of the law, but... Then they were persuaded. They were hindered from that race. Literally, in Greek, it's they were cut in. They were cut in. They, they were tripped up. By who? Who do you think? <laughs> the Judaizers. Those false teachers who taught, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised. And these Judaizers were eloquent and persuasive with their words. So in verse 8, Paul makes it clear that persuasion, that persuasion is not from God. God had called them to be free, not to, in bondage to the law. God's calling on the believers is clear in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. We saw the first, first message in this series. Paul says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ, and are turning to a different gospel. What did God call the Galatians to? He called them to freedom. So the choice before the Galatians is clear. Devote your life to the truth of the gospel or devote your life to the Mosaic law. You can't do both. And the gospel provides freedom and life while the law provides slavery and death. I think the choice is clear. Paul's trying to persuade them back. These Judaizers, though, they were persuasive this persuasion is an obstacle to freedom. The second obstacle is a little false teaching. <laughs> a little false teaching. That's verses 9 through 12. Look at verse 9. Let's just see this. Verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. This is a common proverb, actually. Uh, Paul uses it elsewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Even Jesus, remember Jesus and his teaching of the disciples? He utilizes this analogy to warn his disciples against the leaven of the Pharisees. You remember that? Now, I don't make bread. Who does? Go ahead and raise your hand. If you, if you make bread, you like to make bread. Okay? You need to make bread. Okay. That was a bad joke. It's a pastor joke, also a dad joke. They're kind of one and the same. I don't make bread, but I've seen my wife make bread. And I see her working with the dough, and there's a really important ingredient to make the bread rise. What is it? Yeast. Now, how much yeast do you need to make a loaf of bread? I actually brought it with me today. You see it? Is that a lot? Kids, is this a lot or a little? Little. little. Is this a little bit? 
Is it two teaspoons, maybe something like that? That's all you need. <laughs> that was not intentional. <laughs> the, ye- <laughs> the, <laughs> the yeast is just a little bit. And what does it do? It, it just affects the whole batch, the whole dough. So here, what's the point? What's Paul saying here? He's saying, you don't need a lot of false teaching to affect the whole church. You just need a little. One, really. You just need one false teaching, one false doctrine to take hold, and the whole church is affected. The whole church is led astray. And Paul is hopeful, though, in verse 10. He's hopeful. Look at verse 10. I myself am persuaded in the Lord you will not accept any other view, but whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. So Paul is saying, I'm persuaded you're not going to continue to follow in this way. As I send this letter to you, you're going to be persuaded back to the one true gospel. But whoever it is that is confusing you, whoever's teaching you this false teaching, whoever's got this yeast and they're, they're planting it in you as a church, that person is going to pay the penalty. And Paul doesn't know who it is. Otherwise, he probably would have named them. Paul's not afraid to name Paul call people out in his letters. Read his letters. You can see Paul calls people out by name, but he doesn't name this person. So scholars believe that he doesn't know exactly who it is. We we could say maybe this is a ringleader unknown to Paul, one of the ringleaders of the Judaizers. Paul doesn't know who it is, but the point is, whoever it is, Paul is convinced, will pay the penalty, that God will make him pay for preaching a false gospel. Now let's move on in verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12, Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In that case, the the offense of the cross has been abolished. I wish those who are disturbing you might also let themselves be mutilated. Wow. Mutilated. So we could say it this way. This is the most delicate way I can say it. If Paul Paul is saying, if you're going to make such a to those Judaizers. If you're going to make such a big deal out of circumcision, just go all the way. <laughs> I'm serious. That, that's what he's saying. And you might say, wow, that seems really harsh. Paul is coming across strong, isn't he? I was listening to a, a podcast this week called Help Me Teach the Bible with Nancy Guthrie. And she had a scholar on uh, scholar on, on Galatians, and I thought it was really interesting what he said. He said, Galatians is where we see Paul at his most passionate. We've seen that already in the book. He compared it to like any parent whose child wandered into a busy street. What would, let me ask you, what would a loving, responsible parent do if their, cho- their little toddler wandered into a busy street? Get out! Hey, get over here! What are you doing in the road? You want, come. That boy, that's really harsh, right? But any, but but we would say any parent should do that. Why? Because the child is in mortal danger. Yeah, it's harsh. Yeah, it's strong. But for Paul, this is eternal life and death is at stake here. Paul is a loving spiritual parent to these Galatians believers. He's he's urgent, he's passionately pleading, he's beckoning these people to spiritual safety. Yeah, he's going to be passionate because the stakes couldn't be higher. So the obstacles to freedom are persuasion and a little false teaching. Paul knows the danger. So now we come to third, our third point, how to use our freedom. So if if we have freedom in Christ, how do we use it? How do we use it? Three ways, three practical ways. First, not for selfishness. Not for selfishness. Look at verse 13. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Freedom in Christ is not a license to sin. We are free from sin, not free to sin. We talked about that last week. We are free from sin, the power of sin, 
but we're not free to sin. In fact, submitting to a sinful pleasures to the flesh is actually bondage, according to Titus chapter 3, verse 3. It says, for we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved. You see that? Enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. Freedom, true freedom is found in serving one another, not serving ourselves. Now we're getting into the practical implications of the gospel. Think about Jesus. Jesus did not use his freedom as a license to selfishness. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, but he took the form of a servant. What did Jesus do the night he was betrayed? What did he do? He washed his, what? Disciples' feet. He served them. He was an example of serving them, and then he served them by laying down his life on the cross for us and for them. Jesus was a servant. And so how should we interact with one another? We should serve one another. Jesus served us to the end. And now we can serve one another. Our freedom in Christ does not give us the right to live for ourselves, but rather compels us to serve one another. So let me ask This question. We're going to have a question for each one of these. Am I selfish or selfless? In my friendships, in my workplace, at my school, in my family, am I selfish or am I selfless? If you are free in Christ, you are called to selflessness. What are some ways that you can serve others this week? Think about that. Maybe jot some ideas down in your notes. How can we serve others? Second way to use our freedom. Second way to use our freedom, love others. Love others. Look at verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Paul here is quoting from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. When one of the scribes asked Jesus which of the commandments is most important Jesus replied in Mark chapter 12, he said, The most important is, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. You see it? There it is again. There is no other command greater than these. Notice Jesus doesn't say commands. He says command. There's no other command greater than these. Jesus ties together these two commandments and makes them one in the same. So in other words, by loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will love our neighbor as ourself. God, if we love God that way, we will be compelled to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we have to ask ourselves this question. How are we loving others as ourselves? There's many ways, many ways to apply this command. We need to ask ourselves this question. How would I want someone to treat me? That's how I should treat others. So I've got some ideas. How do we want to be treated? With respect, kindness, gentleness, patience, seeking to understand before being understood, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. These are all practical ways to love our neighbor as ourselves. So how are we doing with this? Let's ask God to help us love those around us better this week, even those who are hard to love, even our enemies. It's the second practical way to use our freedom. Here's the third. The third way to use our freedom is not for fighting. (laughs) Not for fighting. Verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. This description, (laughs) it's kind of how animals would behave, isn't it? Or toddlers. (laughs) If you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Scholars have actually suggested that this false teaching that we've been talking about created divisions within the church and is causing fighting within the church. It's a good thing that the church never fights today about issues. Our freedom in Christ does not, does not give us 
freedom to fight. So let me ask you this. Are you in a disagreement with someone, even a fellow believer? Right now, you're in the midst of a disagreement, a strong disagreement, a passionate disagreement. We are called to be free. So we've been set free. Don't miss this. We've been set free from the need to be right. We've been set free from the need to have people like us. We've been set free from the need to prove someone else wrong. So take the hit. You know what? Take the hit. Let it roll down your back. Jesus took the hit for us on the cross, didn't he? He took the hit for us. So we need to learn to do the same. We need to learn to forgive others. Don't fight with them. There's been a lot of fighting these days, even amongst Christians. And we need to stop. We just need to stop. See, Satan wants us to fight. Why? Because, what does the text say? We will be consumed by one another. He's just being lazy, <laughs> Satan. If he, <laughs> if he can get us to fight with one another, he can take a day off. He doesn't need to do anything. Satan, listen, Satan cannot hurt us as believers because the Spirit of God lives in us. He's not a threat to us in the sense that he, he can't take away our salvation. He doesn't have power over us the way that maybe we've thought in the past. We have protection, the protection of Christ, who is infinitely more powerful than Satan. But Satan can accuse us. He can discourage us. He can divide us with his lies if we believe him. So we need to be well acquainted with the truth of God's word. And we need to remember our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and the powers and the principalities and the authorities of the age. We, we have an enemy, and it's not one another. It's Satan. And he would love to get us off track. How much time do we waste fighting about things that don't really matter? And even if they do matter, they don't matter for eternity. It gets us off track. It gets us off mission. And what is our mission as a church? Our mission is to develop gospel-centered disciples, sharing the hope of Christ to transform lives. We can get really off track. We can spin our wheels. We can waste a lot of time wondering, do I agree or disagree with Aaron Rodgers on how he handles COVID? <laughs> right? I, we, could, we could fight. We could battle about that. And really... It doesn't matter in the end. What, what matters is our lost neighbors, our lost family members, our lost friends who need the hope of Christ. And that's why we have this as our mission. We need to stay on mission. And fighting gets us off mission. We can easily be, get put off track by fighting with one another. So l- let me ask you this as we close. Do you find yourself, you find yourself handcuffed today? You find yourself handcuffed. Maybe spiritually, maybe you never turn to Christ. Maybe right now God is working on you and you need to let him win. You need to submit to him. Maybe you're, maybe you're handcuffed emotionally or you are a believer in Christ, you, you're, but you're going through a trial, you're going through a, a difficult time. Many of us are, but we need to know spiritually, God has set us free not to live for ourselves, not to, not to fight, but to live for others, and serve others, to share the good news of Jesus with others. So let's submit to him. Let's care for one another. Why? Because for freedom, Christ set us free. Let's pray. God, we pray that you would help us to live in the freedom that we've already received as believers in Christ. And even now, as we dwell on, as we think about, as we meditate on Jesus and what he did for us on the cross by taking communion, I pray that you would meet us. That would, you would speak to us of the things that we've already seen in your word this morning. I pray that you would convict us, that you would uh, draw us close to you. I pray that you would... Uh, that we would listen, that we would submit, that we would turn to you and believe uh, that what you say is best, what you have called us to is right. I pray that you would help us to walk closely with you and bless our fellowship uh, as we continue in this service. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen.